That was five of you. This morning, five people, Lord, are going to have an amazing week. There's a lot happening this week. So if you are excited about being busy, say, hey. hey. All right, so first thing, if you are in our joy group, which is just older youth, which if you're not 55 or older, sorry, <laughs> you can't come. Well, all right then. Uh, Tuesday. The guys and the gals are meeting at Rainbow Grill in Granville, which is on the Chicago Drive, I believe, at 1130 for lunch. So please let them know if you're going to be there. It's an amazing time of connecting and getting to know one another. And I know some people don't really want to know each other. It's just a fact of life. But what happens when you get to know people is amazing things happen. And the cool thing that I find is you find out sometimes people aren't like you. And how many of you have gotten to the point in life where you're like, you really appreciate people that aren't you? If you haven't, you need to squash your pride, take a dose of humility, and begin to learn to celebrate that they're not like you. Because the cool thing is they really compliment you if you'll, if you'll dig into it. But next thing is we've got Saturday, a week from yesterday. How many are spring clean and wasn't yesterday a beautiful day to get out and do some raking or some weeding or some planting? All right, it's okay. You guys just sat at home. That's all right. Anyway, next Saturday, we're going to be here on the grounds, and we're going to be doing some great work. Miss Chris did an amazing job. We even have pictures, not just words. We have pictures and words to help you understand what we hope to accomplish around the grounds because we want to make it beautiful because we know curb appeal is a thing. Because how many of you, like, if you walk to your house and you see trash, you're not real happy? Okay, you guys like trash. That's okay. Good. We'll, we'll move on. We'll find an area maybe that you like. <laughs> anyway, a week from this week uh, at 4 p.m., say a week from this week at 4 p.m. All right, now turn to your neighbor that didn't say it and say, hey, he said a week from this week at 4 p.m., we're having our night of worship. And listen, if you don't, if you haven't heard anything or if you haven't, like, seen anything that's going on, this is a thing we're hosting, but it's not really our thing. It's a God thing. We've got representation from numerous churches. Zeke's with us this morning. Give it up for Zeke. Help us out on keys this morning. All the way from Mount Pleasant. He'll be playing that night. There's, this stage is going to be full. And we've got singers and musicians, and we're going to just have an amazing night. The cool thing is we're celebrating people getting baptized. So if you haven't been baptized and you want to get baptized, we encourage you to see us so that we know you're getting baptized. We've got a young lady who's going to share her testimony of coming from darkness to light. I said there's a young lady who's going to share her testimony from going from darkness to light. Whew. It's going to be Bonkers. I mean, it's going to be just amazing. And how many know we can have fun as Christians? 
Can I press even further and say, as Christians, we should be the ones having the most fun? Like, seriously, ask your neighbor, did you come ready to have fun this morning? Because if it's not fun, listen, my grandpa, when I was growing up, my brother and I, growing up, my, my grandpa said to me, literally, you better find a job where you can have fun because that's all you know how to do is laugh and yuck it up. I got to go in ministry. Whew. Anyway, last one. A week for, or two weeks from today, you want to be here. We are so, so blessed in this house. There is a service, a culture of service in the house, and we're going to be honoring and celebrating all of our people that serve and volunteer, and it's going to be just a blast. And then how many like food? Now, don't sneak in here like quarter to 12. You know, service starts at 1030, but we're going to have a potluck, and we're going to tear, put on the, I'm so lost, put on a bib, you know, because if we spill food, we're going to put on the feed bag, and we're just going to. Whatever, we're doing something. Yes. All churches invited, not just those that serve. Although that would be kind of cool. But we won't do that. Because like if a guest comes that morning, they're like, oh, nice, thanks. You called me to church. Can't eat with you, but I can go to church. You're the one that's doing it. I know you're telling me to wrap it up, but you, you started it. Anyway, that's two weeks from today. How many ready to meet one of our couples from our church? Woo. Give it up for David. Am I on? Sweet. I don't really like these headsets to be, yeah, yeah, come on, come on up. I really don't like these headsets to begin with. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, stop. thanks, man. All right, so we're going to be, we're kicking off this new thing every single month. Um, this is actually inspired by Justin Loser, where we, in the month of February, we had um, a couple couples coming up, kind of sharing a little bit about their story, and so um, in conversation with him, he said, I'd like to see more of that. I, I think it'd be kind of cool to be able to bring up a couple every single month and, and you know, have the congregation learn about them. So um, this month, we have Ron and Kara Lee. Give it up for them. Yeah. So I'm going to be asking them a couple of questions, and they'll, they'll go ahead and explain. That. And I sent these questions to them in advance. That way they had some time to prepare and kind of expound on those things. You guys ready? Not too much, but a little bit. All right, so um, we have Ron and Kara Lee Harkins, right? So uh, go ahead and tell everybody, how did you guys meet? Oh, this is going to be fun. I like this story. I like to tell this story. I was 16 and out having a lot of fun. I was a member of a square dance club, and I was uh, promoting our anniversary dance that was coming up. So I was... Uh, I was also into badges, earning badges. Um, anyway, Trish has seen the badges, Trish and Dale. But anyway, uh, Tosh, you're right. <laughs> she grinned. Anyway, so I was trying to earn this badge uh, where you dance 30 nights in a row. Uh, in Denver, you can do that because there's square dance clubs everywhere. Um, anyway, uh, at the time, I had... Three girlfriends. I was not committed, and they all knew each other. <laughs> they all at the same club, but I always had someone to go dancing with. And I was just, in, I used to brag about it. I, I thought that was great. But anyway, at 16, so <laughs> uncommitted, but had a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was like 20 days into this um, thing of trying to dance 30 nights in a row and I didn't want to miss and all my girlfriends failed me none of them could go Man. and I was like you can't go to a dance alone so I walked downstairs and knocked on my sister's room and I said she was 18 months younger than I am so she was 15 15 and a half something like that anyway I said Wanda let's go dancing she said okay she good sister so she and I went out to this dance, clear on the other side of Denver, like 25 miles away. We walked in. This was an old folks club, you know, 50 years old type old folks. <laughs> anyway, and it was like, okay, well, at least I'm here, you know. So we signed the guest book, Ron Harkins, Wanda Harkins. Well, I looked over there, and there was this really cute redhead with freckles and long legs. And I thought, oh, she looks good. But she was committed with this guy and I thought oh man 
So anyway, so I danced about half the night with my sister, and I finally got fed up. I, I, I said, I'm going to go ask that cute redhead to dance. Come to find out she was had hornswoggled this guy into dancing with her so she could take lessons, and she wasn't boyfriend or committed or anything awesome. So I danced the rest of the night with him, with her, with her, with her. <laughs> so anyway, I invited her to the anniversary dance, and I'll be darned if she didn't show up, and we've pretty much been a couple ever since. So Wow. Yes, and I saw this tall guy with blue eyes and blonde hair, and I checked out the, um, you have to register when you go? Yes, yes. And they signed it, Wanda Harkins and Ron Harkins, so I thought they were married. <laughs> but then I found out they weren't married. <laughs> I ended up with him and a sister. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. I mean, I mean, who I've never heard of anyone who met their future wife while dating their sister. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Hi. And this is Roger. It's our set. Hi. Hey, say hi to Roger. You stay up here with us? All right, that's awesome. Okay, so you guys both met. How long have you been married? I got a calculator out and I figured it out this weekend. It takes it'll, that. <laughs> as of May 29th, coming up, it'll be 48 years. Wow. <laughs> but as of February just passed, we've been a couple for 52. Wow, that's awesome. And no regrets. All right, I'll start with you, Carolee. Uh, what is your favorite characteristic about Ron and why? Um, he's so faithful. But one thing I really love about him is his resilience. We have been knocked down so many times, and he doesn't stay down. That's awesome. Yeah. Ron? Um, other than the red hair, freckles, and long legs? <laughs> That's the shallow that part. But it was definitely the beginning. <laughs> that changes. I stay the same, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I think it has to be the characteristic I love about her best is her love. It's been unconditional, even, even when I wasn't nice to be around, even when I screwed up, and even when I dragged the family through rough times. She was there. She loved me. And that's got to be, I mean, what a blessing, you know. That's a keeper. Yes, absolutely. After Great, 48 man. years, I can say, yep, she's a keeper. And the thing is, it keeps getting better. That's yes. That's what's amazing. Yeah. You All make right. it for those, if you can make it through those first five to seven years, um, then it really starts getting better. Awesome, awesome. All right, lastly, describe a time where you felt God pour out his blessings on the both of you. Okay, I'm going to take this one. Um, no. <laughs> Me. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. God blessed us with a, another son after we, we were 60 years old. Carolee just turned 60, and God gave us a baby. Roger. Yep. <laughs> so. Anyway, one time that I felt for our whole family that we were really blessed is we, when the pastor was talking about Job, I thought, oh my gosh, we have had so many like Job experiences, only ours didn't come all at once. It was like slow bleed. So at one point, first decade, no, by the second decade of our marriage, we had lost our home, we'd lost our business, we had to go bankrupt. I did try to throw our marriage away, but I responded to God's word, and I did not. And it was, we were down to our lowest. So we had to, I was praying and praying and praying, and I did not want to declare bankruptcy. It was a business bankruptcy, and I did not want to do that because that wasn't a godly thing to do. 
So we did everything we could, and we just kept going further and further. I was reading the scriptures, and I found out in neon lights one day, it said that God won't tempt you beyond what you're able, and at the end of it, it says he will provide a way out. Uh, so I felt like that was okay. So we went to North Platte, Nebraska, which was 100 miles away, <laughs> and met with the lawyer, and when we came out, that, it, that was a low, low point in our life, and when we came out, we were driving west, and there was the most vibrant, full rainbow I have ever seen in my life, and it stayed, and it stayed, and at that point, I thought, I hear you, Lord, it's going to be okay, and that's when I just felt our whole family was going to be blessed. Awesome. It's awesome. Can you got anything to add? I do. Okay. Um, as she was saying, the bankruptcy was my fault. I made a lot of stupid decisions. The first 10 to 15 years of our life, I was constantly making stupid decisions that cost tons of money, and I was dragging our family through all of the hardships that I created. Um, and, and I think part of the blessings came when I made the commitment uh, to the Lord and to Kara Lee that I would make no major financial decisions without Kara Lee's approval. And it, and that turned things around and God has, that's, that's when the blessings really started pouring in. Uh, the Bible says that we are submit, wives are, uh, husbands and wives are submit one to another. It's not just wives submitting to the husband. It's the wife, husbands and wives are to submit to one another. And when I began doing that, she offset my uh, crazy whims <laughs> and saved and began saving us from all of the dumb decisions <laughs> that I was trying to make. And it's really made a difference. And I guess the final thing I would like to part with you, um, as an Uber driver, uh, I get asked the question a lot by young couples, either engaged or just married, how long you've been married, and when they find out it's, it's 45, 48 years, they ask me the question, what is the secret to staying married? And God has given me that answer. And the, married, the love that causes a marriage to last is a love that's based on a choice. It's not a feeling. If you live your marriage, your life and your marriage based on feelings, you're in trouble because feelings ebb and flow. And uh, husband and wives, it doesn't matter how in love you are, there will be times when you don't like them. Oh, man, we couldn't stand each other. <laughs> you know, but when you don't like them, when you choose to love them in spite of the feelings, that's the secret. To a long marriage. Oh, yes, and pray, Lord, let me see him the way you see him, and that our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers and evil things. So and just with God, when, yay. And when you've been married for 40 years and you're 60 years old, Pay attention, you might receive a son. <laughs> blessing, big That's blessing. awesome. That's awesome. Give it up for Ron and Kara Lee. Yeah. Give it up for Miss Tasha. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. This is a walking infomercial today because I just got to tell you that um, with life groups, we were able to, um, Ron and Carolee and, and Roger were a part of our life group, and we got to know this family, and they are an amazing couple. And we've uh, just learned in so many things about them and um, got to see Ron's square dancing vest with all of his badges, and it's really cool. So anyway, we love them and appreciate you guys and for all that you've shared with us. So thank you for that. But today we... Um, Gonna gonna talk about offering for a quick minute, but I do have to say that last week, Pastor, you had said, "Hey, everybody, have a, a a rough week, a hard week, you know, raise your hand." And I was like, "No, I'm good." And I felt like you were just kind of pushing, like, "Yeah, you all had a rough week." No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I was sitting in my chair thinking, yeah, "No, I'm I've been great." And then, then it hit me. 
the cement pole in Walmart literally hit me as I turned. And that's what started my week uh, last week with our, our new car. And so, um, yep, we were, we were in Walmart and I hit the cement pole and I didn't stop. I kept the gas going and it went down my entire car. And I got into the parking spot and I was just devastated that I've just destroyed our brand new car. And immediately I was like, Lord, what have I done? Wh what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? Am I too prideful? Did you need to take my brand new car and make it look ugly? Like, what is it? What is it? And, and my husband in wisdom, I believe said, hey, sometimes things just happen. Like it's life, right? Um, and then, then the work week came and it, like, I don't know what happened with the kids at school and, and staff members. And it was just a week full of tension, like coming off a great vacation. Um, my husband and I had some intense, loving conversations. And finally I got to work and, you know, sometimes the, um, what you think might be the voice of the Lord is not. Because sometimes the enemy can sound a lot like him. And then it hit me at work, and I did. I had to swallow my pride and text my husband and said, you know what, I just need you to pray for me because, man, like, I, I'm listening to the wrong things here. And so um, I thought immediately, like, how much is this car going to get, like, going to cost us to fix, you know, like all of these things. And then the Lord said, you know what, I will supply all of your needs, what you need. And so I was reminded to go back to Philippians 4.18, and, and again, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And, and then I thought about, like, Paul writing that letter, right? And that is a letter um, to encourage us. It gives us hope in walking out our daily um, faith walk, right? So what a week I had. And, and I know some of you may have had that week, and I'm not going to ask you because I don't want you to, to work, like, wake up Monday and have a rough week. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God's promises are throughout his word. They page after page after page of his promises to us. And when we do have just life happen, just because we live in a world where there's cement poles in a place they shouldn't be in the parking lot, um, like life happens. And just to remind us, like God has got you. He's going to take care of you. And I can say that because when I am faithful and we are faithful with what God says to do, he says, try me in these things. Like he requires his 10% back, right? Like we do that. We are obedient. And in that, his, he's promised like he's going to take care of us. And I believe that as I go through this process, God's got me. He's got the right person to fix. And, and then our, our statement that we've been saying, we're receiving those checks in the mail, people. I'm not, this is, again, a, a walking infomercial. I literally went to the mailbox and there's like, hey, the bank had $160 for you that you didn't know. It's been in there for five years. So if you want it, you can have it back. Sign this paper. And then another check came, like literally these things that we've been speaking, like say them. I, I promise you, say them after church as we do those declarations. When you are faithful, those things will happen. It might be time. It might be um, favor with somebody else. It might be rebates. It might be a new job. It might be a new opportunity. But God is so faithful. And so like Paul encouraged me with his letter that he wrote so many years ago, I just want to encourage you, like take that step of faith like pa Pastor talked about. If you've never tithed, maybe today is the day. Maybe today you step out in faith and just say, you know what, like why not, right? So as you um, gather your things whether you send that on Kindred or, or put your monies and your tithe in the envelope. Um, here's our giving box online. You can still give um, with the information. But just join me in prayer and believing that God is going to do something amazing for all of your lives this week. So, Father, I just thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, I thank you that you will supply all of our needs. Lord, not just our, not our wants, but, Father, our needs. You know um, every hair on our heads. You know what we need in order to be um, successful, Lord, in our walk with you, Lord. I thank you for encouraging us. I thank you for providing uh, what we need today, Father. So as we give our, our tithes and our offerings, Lord, use them, Lord, to further the kingdom. Use them to not just reach this church and this community, but, Father, 
out into the state and out into the other countries, Lord, and, and allow those things um, just to spread your love and to spread your word. I give you thanks, Father, for what you're going to do. In your precious and holy name, I pray. Amen. I want to sing a new song. We'll shout it out. The whole thing, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sing, there's a place. There is a place where we can seek his face. His presence and touched by His grace. There is a sound, I hear it all around. Worship, well, worship is rising and people crying out. I want to sing a new song, we'll shout it out. There's freedom, there's freedom in Jesus and power to save. I'm glad there's a name. There is a name well, like no other name. There's freedom, there's freedom in Jesus. Oh, well, shout out his name. I want to sing a new song. Well, shout it out. Just here in my spirit this morning where the spirit of the Lord is there is where the spirit of the Lord is 
There's freedom. There's freedom in this house today. So matter, no matter what baggage you brought, no matter what bondages you brought, no matter what hurts you brought, no matter what wounds you've brought this morning, we believe in the name of Jesus. We believe that he's purchased our freedom. He's purchased our salvation. And as we begin to declare this this morning, we're going to raise a hallelujah. How many know there's power in your praise this morning? Come on, there's power in your praise this morning. And I just feel compelled to encourage you to find a place where you can be free to worship. Because sometimes when there's a person on my left and my right, it's kind of hard to raise my hands because what are they going to think? When there's somebody in my way, how can I sway back and forth because I don't want to bump into them? So I just encourage you, the altars are always open. I love that we have lots of space to worship. And so maybe you need to find a quiet place and just get on your knees before the Lord and just pour your heart out to him. Maybe you've had one of those weeks. Feel free to do that. That's why we're here. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my Will I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief? Oh, will I raise a hallelujah? See, my weapon is a melody. Ah. Will I raise a hallelujah? Then heaven comes to fight for me.
sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. I'll sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. I'll sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. Oh, I'm to sing. sing hallelujah to? What do you need to shout hallelujah to? Name it this morning. Name what it is you need to shout hallelujah to and you need to see victory over because we believe in Jesus' name you're leaving not the same. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus, you, Jesus, be the center of my life, Jesus, be the center.
Don't be so quick to, to try to, you know, exit his presence. Right now, just close your eyes. I want you to, I want you to ask yourself, what brought you here today? What brought you here today? today because it's so easy to just go with the motions you know let it be just kind of like a transaction wake up you get ready you head to church you you sing the five songs you know you put a little in the in the in the offering box and you know you let the you let the preacher tell you something that you may have heard and you've forgotten about or maybe something that you didn't know What brought you here today? What is it in your life that you gotta you gotta put put, the, put at the feet of Jesus and say, "I need help. I need help." Don't wait until the right word in the sermon is said to then step out and become vulnerable for, for the Holy Spirit. Don't wait. Dear Holy Father, we just thank you for today and this opportunity just to be here. God, I pray that you will, you will, with our, our open hearts and our open eyes and our open ears, that God, that you will begin to pour out into us and start to reveal the things that are in our lives or the things that you, you want to do in our lives. God, I just thank you for everything that you've done so far and everything that you're about to do. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Slap somebody a high five. Tell them I'm so glad that you can be here today. Who's having a good time so far? Yeah, 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 yeah. We've been having church and we're going to have church. I'm excited. I'm excited. Seth, could you throw on lights? Uh, be one, three, and five for me. I want to be able to see you guys. No, don't brighten those lights. Don't brighten those ones. I don't want, blinds me even more. That's awesome. That's awesome. This month is busy here at Abundant Life. God is doing amazing things. We have things planned, and we know that God's going to continue to move. It's, it's, it's awesome. And one of those things is we have the opportunity today, there's a, a group of us that's going to go downtown and we're going to connect with uh, um, some of the people that don't have homes down there. There's a lot of them. So we're going to go down there and uh, we're going to uh, give them, you know, cheeseburgers from McDonald's and bottled water and connect with them. Um, for those that are, that are planning on coming, can you, can you come forward? I can't really see where, where you guys are at. Yeah, Brent and Krista and Kendall and I don't know where my wife went. So these people, we all plan now we're going to go down. Yeah, yeah, right. That, that's good right there. Because what I want to do is I want I want to be able to have a prayer for all of us. Because I believe that God is really going to move. Because the thing is, and what inspired all this is um, I was talking to my dad. And we had talked about, you know, um, previous experiences that he had had doing, you know, street witnessing and and it really started to stir in my heart, and I got excited, and I was like, I would love to do something like that. But then the Lord had kind of placed on me. He said, David, how 
can you go and try to feed their spiritual need if their physical need has not been met yet? You know what I mean? These people, they're, they're, they're hungry. They're, they're just physically, they're hungry. And if I go and I just try to talk and just say, you know, Jesus can do this in your life, that's all true, but it's not, we want to be able to meet that physical need that's, that's screaming in, inside of them. So this group, has, these guys are awesome. I've been communicating with them. And um, I, in, in praise and worship, it kind of dawned on me, I want to make this decision. Um, is there anybody else that would like to come downtown with us? You got to commit. We're going to leave here at 1.30. We're going to start making our way downtown. Is there anybody else that would like to come with us? All right. Awesome. So we're going to do this as a quarterly thing. Every, uh, the next one's going to be in July. So if you have that heart for evangelism and you just have a heart for loving people, uh, please see me so that we can get connected and we can get you in touch with when the next one's going to happen. But if I could have everybody stand up and please uh, go ahead and uh, extend your hands for a pastor. I'm going to actually have you uh, pray over this because I'm also going to be going with these guys yeah, too. Absolutely. Um, real quick, um, can we have, uh, we got Three ladies, two guys. Can I have uh, some people that will stand behind them or stand in front of them? And just, it's not about you. It's just obedience. And because um, how many know they need a hedge of protection? If you don't know what a hedge of protection is, it means the enemy loves to mess with us. And we want to pray a hedge of protection around their minds, their hearts. They know their heart. They know their intentions. And we want the Lord to go before them. The scripture says the Lord will go before us. And so this morning, whatever the Lord's laying on your heart, speak that over them. If it's safety, if it's wisdom, if it's love, if it's grace, if it's compassion, if it's God, anoint their eyes that they see these individuals as you see them. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you give them wisdom and discernment, that they can speak to the potential of the individuals they're handing a cheeseburger to. That they call out the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists. That they speak to the God anointing and God yeah. calling. in each and every the individual, individuals that they're getting ready to touch, this is what God wants to do. Not just in this moment, but as you go beyond these four walls this week, that's what God wants to do. And if you're willing, just say, God, I receive it. God, I receive that anointing to see as you see, to hear as you hear, to walk as you walk, to speak as you speak, and give me wisdom beyond me. And we just call souls, yes. salvations to take place, yes. healings to take place, yes. physically, mentally, spiritually. God, in the name of Jesus, anoint these yes. individuals that they be used so radically for you that they light a fire. Where they're going that ignites a revival and a movement that is beyond and above them. And we give you praise for all you're going to accomplish in them and through them. And we thank you for favor. God, the favor that you've granted David through relationship to get the connections that he has. God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that this would birth beyond abundant life because it's not just us. It's you. Yeah. This is your heart for your community. And so we pray that they would ignite this in others, that others would catch it, and that they would be ignited to do the same or even greater. In Jesus' name, yes. we thank you, and we look yes. forward. We praise you in advance yes. for the praise reports that are going to be made. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Can you celebrate in advance for what God's going to do? No, lives are going to be changed. Come on, somebody. Get excited about being changed. Awesome, awesome. And I'm looking right at the time, and we're not, we don't have a lot of time, but it's just great. All the things that we've done, we had an amazing worship service. We were able to learn about Ron and Kara Lee, and uh, just a lot of things happening on Sunday morning. And that's what church is all about. We go through it together. This is a faith family. We go through the ups. We triumph together. We go through the trials together. So I'm just... I love each and every single one of you. I, I know I was standing out in the parking lot, you know, running your cars down, trying to welcome each and every single one of you. I, I, I was able to touch base with a lot of you. If there wasn't, I just want to welcome you. And uh, if I don't know you, I'll, I'll be sure to, to learn your guys' names. But <clears throat> for the message today, it's really funny because this started actually birthing itself about four, three, three weeks ago. And... Uh, I had no idea that that pastor was going to talk about Job last week. 
And it was just kind of cool how that worked out because there was a highlighted point in his message talking about Job where he had said in the word, it says that Job was blameless and upright. And that's what allowed God, and, and that's why God had placed him forward with someone who was so dedicated in his faith. He was blameless and he was uh, standing upright. But, is that and so we, we know the story of that and that he was able to to go through it but also reap benefits out of it. Can I compare? Am I in a position where God can pour out his blessings through trials because I'm living blamelessly and I'm upright? And the title of this, this message is, is asking yourself, what is your foundation on? You know, you, you build this, this walk with God. You build this relationship, and you begin to, to, to start to build on that. But before you do that, what is your foundation standing on? So if you would, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. Um, this entire chapter, Jesus is instructing his disciples to, um, you know, certain things. Some things that he touches on is um, judging others. Ask, seek, and knock. The narrow and wide gates true and false prophets, and true and false disciples. So he's talking about all these things, instructing them to do things very specifically. Verse 24 through 27, after all that, it says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. It's so easy for us to dive in the word and hear about it. But it, it's difficult to apply that to our lives consistently. And even in that too, I love the Bible. When, it, when, when you hear these stories, there are so many dynamics that come into it from different points of view. Because growing up, I always looked at this one way. You know, when I get saved and I start to build my house and build that relationship with God, it's all about the actions. It's all about the things that I do. And it's easy when Jesus is saying these things to just do it by actions. Well, I show up to church. Well, I, I love my family. Well, I, I do all these things. But when we, when we come to Christ and we make that decision that, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to dedicate my life to you. What happens next? What do you do next? Do you hyper fixate on all the things that, you know, you, you box up and say this is what a good Christian does? I'm going to go to church every single Sunday. I'm going to tithe and give offerings every single Sunday without fail. I'm going to read my Bible every single day. I'm going to do the devotions, and I hyper fixate on everything. And I start trying to build this, this great relationship with God. But what I fail to do is understand that when I made that decision— that I'm going to give my life to God, there are things that have to be removed that were in my life. I can't just make the decision and take off and run while the chains are still linked to me. Right? But that's what happens. We hit that moment where we say, I'm going to dedicate my life, and I'm going to change, and I'm gonna, I'm, from now on I'm going to do all these things, but there's still stuff that's lingering in your life. We fight an enemy who is not dumb, a master manipulator, a master manipulator. He knows you by detail. He knows you specifically. He knows the things that, that, that you enjoy, the things that you dislike. He knows you. If I make this decision where I have all these things that are going on in my life and none of them point back to God and none of them benefit my relationship with God and I say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm ready to make God 
my Savior. I'm ready for him to save me. I'm ready to build that relationship with him. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I make that decision, and I say, from this moment on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the chains right where they are, and I'm going to take off. And Satan's watching you, and he sees you make that decision, and, he walk, and you start walking away. And as you're walking away, he's looking at you, and he sees, oh, they still got some chains that are lingering on them. I'm not going to touch them right now. Because if I, if I start attacking them right away, the things that are still lingering on them become very apparent. They become very noticeable. And it's so easy for me to say, oh, forgot that, and start acting on those things. But a master manipulator, he knows, oh, I'll let that go dormant. I'll let that go dormant. They won't, they won't remember about that. And then behind the scenes, not in front of them, behind the scenes, I'm going to start germinating that. And I'm going to start growing that. And next thing you know it, when that chain develops and gets bigger once again, I can get them. A master manipulator. We're going to move forward. We're going to keep going. John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. Uh, if you could throw that up there. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This is what, that's what they said to Jesus. Test him that, I have to read this, this is not working out for me. Test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the sand or ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And then Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one. No one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from, on, from now on, sin no more. Praise God. Praise God for his grace. Praise God for his mercy. But be careful. Like I said before, a lot of times in these stories, there's, there's a lot to unfold. There's many points of, points of view to look at. Praise God that we come to him. So messed up, so dirty. We have absolutely nothing but condemnation to hell that we deserve. But yet he loves us and he shows us that grace and he shows us that mercy and he saves us. But then Jesus not only takes that opportunity to save her, but then he disciples her. And at the very end, he said, after all that, go and from now on sin no more. How many people are coming to Christ and they're repenting without deliverance? Let me say that one more time. How many of us have come to Christ and we've come with it with a heart of repentance and we want forgiveness and we want God to save us, but we don't receive deliverance from the life? The best way that I can put that, my mom when I was, had horrible grades and, and getting beat on a daily basis because I would lie about them and I was just, I was not good. She would tell me, you know, after the discipline, I mean, it would still be discipline, but after the discipline, she would take a moment to kind of really talk to me. After we, we settled all that, you know, uh, you know, that discipline, and we got a moment to be able to just sit down and just talk about what's going on. And I would tell her, Mom, I'm changing, I'm changing, I promise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. She would ask me, what are you, what's your plan? What are you going to do? And I'd say, I'm going to go tomorrow, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to this teacher, and I'm going to talk to this teacher, and I'm going to talk to this teacher. And it would never change, and she knows that. Because I would, just, I would say the same thing, and I'll never forget, there was one time that we were upstairs in my bedroom talking after, after I just got done lying. She would ask me, literally, David, I'm about to open up the portal. I'm about to see your grades right now. What am I going to see? I don't know. I don't know. The grades should be good. You know, 
No, and they're not. I know I was failing every doggone class. And, I, oh, and then when it would pop up. I'm like, but the teacher said she was going to turn in this assignment, and I, I promised I turned in that assignment, and just lies, a bunch of lies. And I'll never forget my mom saying, David, a, a, an, a, an apology without change is a broken promise. We'll say it again. Make an, an apology to someone without changing is a intentional broken promise. I'll throw that in there. I intentionally broke that promise. When I apologize, I am so sorry. I can't believe I did this. And, you know, I want you to forgive me. Please, please forgive me, forgive me. And I don't go and I take with that and I don't change it. I'm intentionally saying that wasn't true. I really wasn't sorry. I really wasn't. When I come to Christ and I say, God, I want you to save me. Please save me. Forgive me for everything that I've done. And I don't, and I don't change those things. I'm intentionally telling God I wasn't serious. It was a feeling. It was a feeling. I know back in December we talked about, we talked about righteousness. And we talked about, you know, cleaning the things out that are currently in your life. And today we're talking about that repentance with deliverance from what you, what you were doing. And so... I'm going to do an illustration here. Um, anybody ever travel? Any travelers around? So when you get to the airport and you're, you know, you're bringing all your, your luggage, what do you do? What do you do? You, you, go, you pass the TSA and, and what happens next? Or maybe this happens before. I don't travel much. But anyways, but what do you do with your luggage? You check your bags in. You check your bags in. Now, when I check my bag in, I... I have all this what comes with me my carry-on so imagine that i bring I, I i come to christ and i say god i am ready i'm done with the life of, of living in all the sin and doing all the things i'm ready to give it all back to you i'm checking it all in and then right as i begin to leave i take my carry-on with me i start bringing this i don't need that i got my carry-on it's got all the essentials in it and God's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I want you completely free. My desire for you is to be completely free. I don't want you to have the carry-on. You don't need the carry-on. You have me. Wherever you're going, where I'm taking you, I have everything for you. Don't worry about it. I remember when Haley and I were our first vacation, we really didn't, we packed some clothes, but we really didn't pack much because Grandma and Grandpa already had their house set up for us. We didn't need anything. They had the toiletries and all that stuff. God is saying, where I have, where I'm wanting to take you, you don't need a carry-on. You don't need to bring anything. I want you completely free. But then we start saying to ourselves, well, I mean, it's my carry-on. It's my personal things. And all right, God, I'll, I'll start giving some of this stuff back to you. I mean, if you, if you say so, if you, you know, uh, if you say I, I absolutely have to, I'll... I'll, you know, I'll give it back to you. And then you start pulling out the items and you start, you start looking at them. And you're like, well, I don't, my, my, my friends and my family, yes, my friends, they, they don't really steer me right. And a lot of the things that I've gotten myself into is because of the bad influence. But, but, they're my friends. And now that I'm saved, I can get them saved, and I can minister to them, and then it starts sounding good. God, I'm going to save them because you saved me, and then I'm going to go save them. And, and it sounds like a great idea. It really does. I'm going to take this as an opportunity to minister to all my friends. I'm not strong enough to do it. I'm not strong enough to go back and without following or tainting the thing that God had for me. But I start justifying it. So I, I got my friends here, and then next it's, you know, the, the t yeah, I could see the TV being a problem. I really could. There's not great things that I've been watching lately, but, you know, uh, I could make the declaration to say, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do it no more, and so 
I, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that too. You know, and the next thing you know, it's, it's uh, well, my job. I need my job. Is my job a toxic work environment? 100%. Is that the reason why I, I'm, I'm swearing like a sailor on a daily basis when I walk through those doors? You're 100% right, but I need my job. I got to be able to, to, to provide for myself. Well, is that job also the reason why you're not able to come to a lot of church functions or faith family things that are planned because your job needs you to work those hours? Yeah, but I need my job. It provides me the money. How can, I, how can I do this without having my job? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set that aside. And then, you know, the, the social media. <laughs> well, well, well. This is a big problem. My phone, my social media, this is, this is a big problem. It really is. I, God, I'll give that to you. I'm not the greatest when it comes to social media. I'm not looking at the right things. I, I'm not having the, the best conversations. The music that I'm listening to is absolute garbage. The things that, that, I, that I'm entertaining, this is your entertainment, by the way. The things that I'm entertaining myself with is absolute trash. But then again... I could, re I, could, I could use this as an opportunity to start sharing my, my, my faith with people through social media. And, and, and then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to you know, only go, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to exclusively do this. I'm going to exclusively do that. And I'll just pay more attention to it. And, ah, you know, you know I hear you, God, but, but I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to keep that too. Do you really think that we're going to... We're going to change any of these things. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a constant fight. And I'm telling you right now, you may have a picture perfect idea of what you're going to do. But you're going to compromise. You're going to make small compromises. Where you're going to say, I am no longer going to listen to 104.5, 105.3, 93.7, 94.5. I'm going to go worship exclusive. So instead of doing the right thing, God, and just absolutely turning off the radio in the car so that I can hear your word and I can dive deeper with you and I can really cleanse myself, instead, I'm going to make my own version of that. Even though you want me to be absolutely 100% free, I'm going to do my own version of that. Next thing you know, I'm driving down, I took on 91.3, what happens? Commercials. I've been there. I've, I've been there. Commercials. You turn on the next one. More commercials. They said they were commercial free, but that, it clearly is not the case. Well, let me just graze over 104.5. That's not a bad song. It's not a dirty song. I can, I can just in the meantime, and then that compromise gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the entertainment. This is probably the biggest issue right here. The entertainment. I start telling myself, this is what I'm going to do. And then that just starts becoming compromise. And I take these small steps that grow larger and larger and larger. And then, you know, with, with work. Well, I'm, I'm going to go in on Sunday morning, and I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go in on Sunday morning, and, and uh, I'm going to tell them, from now on, I cannot work any more Sunday mornings. Well, first things first, your job's like, you've been working Sunday mornings for the last two months. So you tell me that you can't work Sunday mornings? I don't necessarily believe that 100%. So I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to start compromising. And you start compromising. You start justifying these things. Same thing with the, the friends. Well, I'm going to change them. I'm going to do all these things. At the end of the day, when you said, God, I want none of this. I want to check this in. I, 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 don't want, I don't want none of this. This is ugly. This is not for me. I know that you have a better thing for me. I know that you have a calling on my life. I know that you want to do things in my life. And I'm ready to be free. I'm ready to change all those things. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how many friendships I have to give up. I don't care if I have to put in my two weeks at work to find another job. I don't care if I have to cut family ties. I don't care what it takes. I want to be free. I'm going to empty this thing out, lay it all at your feet, and I'm just going to throw it all aside. I don't care about what it takes. I don't. I don't care. The thing is, is that this isn't easy. Making the decision to follow Christ is going to be some of the most difficult times in your entire life. I am promising you that. 
I'm promising you. A great indication that you're on the right track. That you're doing the right things. A great indication that you are really on the right track is Satan is going to be pounding on your door. He is going to be attacking you. He is going to be taking things away. He's going to be burning bridges for you. You are going to go through turmoil. You are going to go through things. Yes, there is God's provision. And that's what we're praying for and we are seeking for God's provision over our life. But I'm telling, and it's not going to happen every single time, but I'm telling you that you are going to go through it. You are going to be made fun of. People are going to ridicule you. People are going to, you know, talk behind your back. It is going to be extremely difficult. But when you make the decision to say, I am giving it all back to you. I don't want anything but your will for my life. I'm taking all this and I'm throwing it at your feet and I'm running the other direction. But are we doing that? Or are there things that are still lingering in my life that are, are really dictating? Or am I developing my own little box of, I want God's will, but it's going to look like this? It's not, it, it, it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. And you know what? My grandpa is the one that talked to me about this. He told me. He said, it's actually, ironically, you'll find, not every time, but you'll find in a lot of cases that people who are full-fledged in sin and that's all that they're doing is just sinful things, when they come to Christ, they are far more successful than people who are in church that have things in their life that's causing them to be lukewarm and they're getting rededicated. That's crazy. It's true. But that's crazy. Someone who is living in full-fledged sin, darkness, they, they are bound for hell. When they make that decision to come to Christ, they are far more successful at it than a person who is struggling with some things. They still have their head on their shoulders somewhat, but they're struggling with little things, and they're, they're contemplating whether this is a great example of whether something should be in your life is to say, would I do this if Jesus was standing right next to me? Would I be looking at the things that I'm looking at if Jesus is sitting right next to me saying, hey, what are we doing? Would I continue doing the things that I'm doing? If Jesus invited me to come to something knowing that I should be there and work pops up and tells me I have to do this, and I go to Jesus, and would I go to Jesus and tell him, I know that you're directing me to something specifically because you have a plan and purpose on my life, and this is what it's going to take to get me in that direction, but I have something far more important. Would I be smoking this cigarette if Jesus was standing next to me? Would I be drinking the alcohol at a social event if Jesus is standing next to me? When you come and you make that decision that God is going to be the center of my life, that is the most important thing to me. Everything that is in my life needs to align with him. That is really when you know I can take any aspect of my life and hold it up next to God and say, is that in alignment? Is that in alignment with your word? Is that in alignment with you and my prayer and all those things? Is that aligning with you? If so, that's, that, that's great. And how can I use that specifically for you? Prayer and fasting. That's another great example. I, growing up, we'd always pray. We'd do the Daniel fast, and we'd, we'd fast the foods. And I, I would say to myself, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, how in the world is fasting food going to grow my relationship with God? Like, what am I, what am I just going to, like, if I'm, if I'm still having meals, that's still going to take time to prepare those meals. And sometimes it would take even more time to make up some vegetables and clean meat versus going to McDonald's and buy. I'd actually have more time to go just pick something up than preparing this. I never understood the food concept. I never understood it. Because this is kind of ridiculous. But then I started, I got older and I got matured a lot more. But I started to understand that the whole concept of fasting is, is making yourself vulnerable. It's taking the things that are in your life that is your, your regular everyday thing and I'm removing it and I'm becoming vulnerable so that God can fill me with his plan and purpose. And that's why the fasting looks different for every single person. Some people, it's a big deal. 
to no longer have sugar in their life. That's a huge deal for them. Some people, it's caffeine. My word, I, I get the biggest headaches when I don't have caffeine. Some people, it's going with no food at all. Whatever it takes to get myself completely vulnerable so that God can fill me with his plan and his purpose on my life. And it's so physically hard. It is so physically hard. And I have to have that mindset when I come to Christ and say that I'm ready to give everything back to you. I have to say, I want none of this. I want absolutely none of this. I don't care how hard it is. I want to be broken on a daily basis so that you can fill me with what you have for me. I want to leave everything behind. I don't care about the friendships that I'm about to ruin. I don't care if I have to stop talking to family members for a while. There are family members that, we each, that each of us have that are enabling the, situ- they're enabling the sin that's in our life. And until you become strong enough in your faith and you have a time frame, you have to tell them, I'm sorry this is about to sound really awkward, but I need to take a break from you. For me. For me. We're not playing games here. This isn't a game. I'm not going to compromise my Christianity. I'm not going to compromise my relationship with God because my best friend, is, his feelings are going to get hurt. I'm not going to compromise my relationship with God if I have to, you know, if I have to compromise that because my my parents have such a stronghold in my life. I'm sorry, but if your parents aren't pointing you back to God, it's time to cut the ties. It's your heavenly father. Your heavenly father should not be compromised for your earthly parents. If you have to cut ties with your parents to restore your relationship with God and get him where you want to be, I'm sorry. That's what it takes. Because I said, I am, I am going to receive salvation and I'm getting delivered from everything. I don't care what it takes. The mindset has to be exactly the same no matter where you are, whether you're in full-fledged sin or whether you're compromising some things. The mindset has to be, God, I want nothing else but you. And if you bring things into my life and it's your will, then I will accept those things. But I don't want anything else. I don't want anything else. Zeke, if you can come forward, we're going to close here. There is a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of you. There is a divine calling that God has for every single one of you. Whether that's in the church, whether that's in your workplace, whether it's at home, or with your friends, God has a divine calling on your life. Every single one of you have giftings and skills that God wants to use because of the calling that he has on your life. But are you in a position and are you in a place where God's calling on your life lines up with where you are? I'm going to do one more illustration. And then we're going to close. There was a point in my life where I was fooling everybody. I had nothing. All my friends were going off to college. They're all going to schools, doing big things. And I remember being at my uh, open house and having a lot of people ask me, like, what are you doing? And I didn't have anything for him. I didn't know what I was going to do. So in that moment, I decided, well, I'm going to pursue ministry. Because God had a calling on my life at the age of 12. It's the first time that I ever heard the voice of God. He was very specific about what he was going to do and the calling that he had. And I wasn't in a point of time, I wasn't in the season where I was ready for that. But because of the circumstances, I decided to push because I knew the calling. And so I decided to force that. And I wasn't where I needed to be. Every single Sunday was a show. Every single one. Very prideful. I had to look a certain way. I had to say, I said the right things. I, like I said, I fooled a lot of people. Frontline ministry. I was doing work. I, I, was, I was in Midland. I was supposed to be interning under my, under my Uncle Felix going through credentialing, working in the church, and I was frontlining on the worship team. 
and I was also helping leading youth, and I was serving as his intern. I was on stage a lot. And I was not where I needed to be. I had a really toxic relationship with a girl. I made a poor decision. I fell away from God, and it all came out. I didn't step down from ministry. If it was my decision, I would have. I got sat down from ministry. I got sat down from ministry. And my Aunt Jamie and my Uncle Felix, they showed me grace. They showed me a lot of grace. And they allowed me to stay to make things right. But I couldn't just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for all the sins. Please forgive me for everything that I've done. I couldn't say those things and just jump right back on stage. I had to go through a process. I had to go through a cleaning process. Pause real quick. There is a difference between receiving salvation and being in the right direction and being right with God and being a clean vessel serving in ministry. I'm going to say that one more time. There is a difference between living in sin and asking God for salvation and being a clean vessel ready to be used by God. It took a while for me to understand that. When I went through that cleaning process, I was in the church just focusing on myself, just cleaning myself out. When I got home, I was in the Word. I was, I was, I was being very diligent about not just making the decision to get saved, but to really go through that process of cleaning myself out of everything. I didn't know what God had for me, but I need to be prepared for that. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And earlier in that, that book, God says to Jeremiah specifically, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were conceived, I've set you apart. I have a divine calling on your life. But are you cleaned out, ready to be used? Are you in a position where God can use you? Because he wants to use every single one of you. It's not just about the, the, the ministry here at church. It's not. God is ready to use every single one of us outside of these four walls. There's a purpose and a plan and a calling on every one of you. That's what he wants for you. When I come, to, when I come and I check my stuff in, he's got this plan that he wants to but I'm not ready for it. Because let me ask you something. If I were to take this serving plate, this little platter, I promise I won't get on the carpet. And I were to walk up to one of you and I were to ask you, is this ready to be used? Would you eat off of this? Anybody want to eat off of this? Anybody? But why? It's, 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 it was in a sinful, it was in a dirty, muddy situation, environment, and it pulled itself out. Some of you know where I'm going with this. But what do you mean I can't be used by you? What do you mean I'm not in a line with God's calling on my life? I'm no longer in the sin. But you're still dirty. There's still things lingering on you. There needs to be a process. It's long. It's hard. You're going to have to make decisions to cut things, cut things out, and remove, your th remove yourself from things. Well, what if I, what if I did a little bit of that? I rinsed myself. I got myself to church. I came every single Sunday. How about now? We're almost there. But it's not about me almost being ready to be used by God. It's not ready for me to almost be ready for God to, to start working in me. Almost isn't good enough for the kingdom. It's not. Every single one of us have to understand that we have an identity in Christ. When you start walking around with the confidence of the shepherd boy David... I don't care if it's a bear. I don't care if it's a lion. I don't care if it's a man. My God is far greater, and I'm in him. 
I don't care what the world has for me. I don't care what comes against me. When I understand who I am in him, this isn't good enough. It's not. Let's throw some soap in there. Let's really start to get serious about this. I got the soap in there. Move it around. I need it on me. I start going. I start working. God, I want nothing. I'm just broken for you. It is all about you. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to be cleaned. I'm ready. Oh, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. If the waiter came up to you and he said, and this is what he gave you your plate on, sopping wet. The back's dirty. It's sopping wet. Haley has a great story about that at Brands. Is this good enough? It's not good enough. It's not good enough. I need to really get in there. I need to really clean. God, I want to start from square one. I'm going to, I don't care what it takes. If I got to fast an entire month and push my body to the limit, I don't care. God, I'm sopping wet. I want to be clean. I want to be cleansed. God, I want your will on my life. I don't care whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, God, it's, it's all about you. I know you have a divine calling on my life. I don't care what I have to go through. I don't care what kind of trials and tribulations that you have for me. I don't care if I want to, if I got to go bankrupt. I don't care if my toxic spouse leaves me. I don't care if, if I become the most unpopular person in my family and I know that they talk about me and they don't invite me to things and they don't do this and they don't do that. I don't care if I go to work planning on doing something, they cut me loose. I don't care what it takes. Whatever it takes to just draw close to you and be who you want me to be. I don't care how long it takes. I don't. I don't. Because it's all about what you have for me. I want to be spotless. Do I know that I'm going to mess up? 100%. 100%. And I will not pretend any different. I know that I will mess up. And I know that you are gracious. And I know that you, you will show me grace. So I'm going to try to stay as righteous as possible. And the moment that I start to see things in my life show up and I start making those poor decisions, I'm turning right back to you. Going through that cleaning process again. This is not something that it's a one and done. This needs to happen on a daily basis. Every day I'm asking God, break me. I want you to break me. I want to be completely vulnerable for you. I want to be broken for you. I want to be ready to be used no matter what that looks like every single day. Every single day. This is going to be up here for a few weeks. This is something that Pastor and I had talked about. Because there are things in your life, in my life, in your life, there are things that shouldn't be there. And are they going to be blatant sin? Maybe, maybe not. But if I took those things and I aligned it with him, I could say that's not great. It's going to hinder. It's going to hinder the call that God has for me. So this trash bin is here right now. And we're going to go through that song, that last song, Jesus at the Center, one more time, all the way through. And I want to encourage you, if there is something in your life that you know should not be there and you need to get it out, bring it forward. Throw it in the bin. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Am I saying take your phone and chuck it in the bin? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I struggle with something day in, day out because of this thing. Now, don't break it. Somebody will meet with you and will help you go through it. Now, if you're telling me that I got to smash the phone because that's, that is the degree that I got to go to to really break free of this thing, then by all means. But if you need to say, I need to 
I need to make the declaration. I need to come in. I got to put it in there. Knowing that somebody after service will connect with me and they will help me. Like I said, we are family, faith family. We all got dirt, a lot of dirt. We came from dirt. We all know that. This is a family thing. And maybe you don't have it here physically with you. Maybe, you know, you don't have whatever that is that you need to put in there. There's these sheets with pens. I want you to come up and I want you to write that down. Starting Monday, I'm going to be looking for a new job. This is my commitment. I don't want names. Don't put your name on it. This is a commitment between me and God. And God, I'm telling you, I'm making the declaration that I'm going to start looking for a new job on Monday. God, when I go home, I'm going to unplug it. I'm making the declaration that I'm going to go home and plug, unplug the TV for X amount of time because it's, it's, it's not benefiting my life. God, I'm going to cut ties with said name. Be specific. Like I said, don't put your name on it. Write it down. And make that declaration that something, something's getting let go or something's going to happen when I put this in there. Like I said, we're going to go through the song. And when you do that, feel free to stay and just dive in his worship a little bit. All right? Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't take the fact that I said this is going to be here a couple of weeks and just, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch base in a couple of weeks. No, do that now. Do that right now. The reason why it's going to be here a couple of weeks is because you're going to start to write things down. And you're going to put it away and you're going to start making that change. And then there's going to be more things that will reveal itself to you because you now have that mindset that I'm ready to be broken and give everything back to you. So when I come back, I got a more that I need to cast in. You know what? All right. Let's go ahead. Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus 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 at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus, you, Jesus, be the center of my life, Jesus, be the center.
Dearly Father, we just thank you for everything that you've done this morning. God, for strongholds that have been broken, for things that have been declared and binded in our lives that we are going to lay at your feet, God. And God, I pray that this will become a continuous process that we die to every single day. God, we, we thank you and we love you and we glorify you. And Lord, I pray that you will guide our footsteps day in, day out, as we walk beyond these four walls, that we will be a beacon of light representing you in everything that we do. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Real quick, real quick, uh, I was just notified that if you have White Caps tickets that you need to get from Chris Plaus, they have them. All right? Okay. Yeah, and if you were planning to join Church the Faith Family next Sunday, we will celebrate with you as you join the Faith Family. So have an amazing week of ministry. <laughs> what are you doing?